Hello! Today's stories come from r slash malicious compliance. We've got four stories of gold today, starting with Kavina Karen wants to use the shoulder lane to escape traffic. I dared her. This happened just a few hours ago. I was driving a semi on a highway when the traffic suddenly became bumper to bumper on a two lane due to an accident a couple miles ahead. Everybody was creeping and I was at the right lane. Suddenly, I saw a regular vehicle, not even an emergency vehicle, on my right side, shoulder lane passing me. There's not even an exit nearby. I was like, heck no to the no. And as soon as I saw a couple vehicles behind me trying to do the same thing, I immediately blocked them by going slightly to the shoulder, so I'm occupying two lanes. I got a few honks, but I couldn't care less. If I'm suffering in traffic jam, everyone should do as well. Shoulder isn't for passing. As long as I didn't see any flashing lights behind me, I'm not opening that shoulder. We're crawling anyway. After a few hundred feet ahead, I saw an idle police cruiser on the shoulder up ahead. Figured that nobody would dare using the shoulder anymore. I merged back to my lane. Turns out, I was right. The shoulder became empty all of a sudden, but that's not the end. While I was chilling, still creeping, I heard very annoying and repetitive honks on my left side. I looked and I saw this lady with huge sunglasses, ponytail, bending down on her seat, looking at me, yelling something, looking outraged. I rolled down and this is the following conversation. You know you're blocking two lanes, right? Me in confusion. Huh? I was behind you on the right lane and you wouldn't move. I honked and you didn't care. That's a shoulder. You're not supposed to drive on the shoulder. That's a lane. You are allowed to drive there. While she's still yelling, incoherently, we are still slowly moving. Then I remembered, there's an idle police cruiser on the shoulder that I saw a while back that we didn't pass yet. I'm sure everyone knows by now. Malicious compliance initiated. I reduce my speed even more, so Karen is faster than me by a little bit on the left lane. Then I dare her by giving her the signal that she can pass me to use the shoulder. She aggressively took it, cut in front of me, and immediately went to the shoulder. However, What Karen didn't know was that the cruiser is already around the corner. I was driving a semi, so my field of vision is much higher and wider than everyone else. Karen was driving a sedan. Her field of vision is much lower and limited. What I didn't take account was how aggressive Karen was driving. She cut the corner so quick without looking and ended up hitting the cruiser. Sorry, Ossifer. It was so abrupt that I can hear the crash pretty loudly. I can also tell that the driver in front of me was gasping in shock as well. I have never seen an officer get out of the cruiser so fast before. This dude practically jumped out of the cruiser in less than one second. Then, this is what I witnessed and heard when I'm creeping slowly with the traffic, not wanting to miss anything. I roll down my passenger window. The officer shouts, get out of the vehicle. Karen is still inside her car, full fluster mode. Get out now. Karen finally gets out and literally word for word. But I wasn't at fault. You were stopping on a lane. This is a shoulder for emergency, not for your car convenience to escape traffic jam. But incoherent sob story as I drive away from the scene. I couldn't hear what's going on anymore, but I kept watching my front as well as the side mirror. Judging from her body movement, she was indeed panicking while pointing at my truck. Don't know why. Then, before the scene disappeared from my mirror, The last thing I saw was the officer pulled out his handcuffs and cuffed Karen. Surprisingly, she complied without causing any more scenes. Then I continued to drive into the sunset. Okay, I'm conflicted. Obviously, blocking the shoulder is wrong, but blocking all those buttholes using the shoulder to bypass traffic gives me the justice tingles, so I'm not going to complain. OP didn't get enough love in the comments. He's not the hero we need, but he's the one we deserve. Let's see a few comments before the next story. Shape of Things said, I used to get so annoyed at the way people drive. Then I realized one day that the person getting the most stressed about it is me. I would block them, beep, be cut off and sworn at, so I stopped. They drive like idiots. It's on them. They cut lanes, drive on the inside, drive like lunatics to get to wherever they're going 20 seconds earlier. It's on them. I drive for me, to keep me safe and to get me to wherever I am going by the time I arrive. So they break all the rules to get ahead by milliseconds. It's not my problem. I will still get to where I'm going in due course. It's just now I get there more relaxed and chilled out and knowing I have driven safer and not taken any unnecessary risks. Life is too short. Let idiots be idiots. Don't own it. Frog said, 
While I am so for karma for Karens and smashing cop cars, I remember reading this one Reddit story the writer said a car was weaving through traffic and OP didn't let them pass. And when the car finally got by and pulled into a vet and ran into the building carrying his dog, who was howling in pain, and every time I hear a story about not letting people pass, I just think of that story. Like, I'm sure that 9 out of 10 something like that isn't the case, but me personally, that 1 out of 10, I'm not willing to chance. Not to mention, if someone is driving erratically, I want them to be as far away from me as possible. Pass me and be on your way. Crash your car somewhere else. Ostatron gets the final word. I can't get behind people being road vigilantes, but I do love to hear about a dumb, selfish driver meeting some consequences. Next up, malicious compliance to malicious compliance. I run a repair shop where I employ a bunch of local kids, ages 16 plus, to learn skills and make some money while we generally sit around and talk about the world while we fix things. We had a client come in with a busted electronic. We fixed it up for her and gave her a decent discount on the work. Her final bill for parts and four hours of labor was $100 even, discounted down from $220. She didn't like the bill. She didn't like the work. She claimed that we'd broken something else. She claimed that the kid who did the work didn't know what she was doing. She did, and I had supervised her. And that the kid who helped her in the front room was rude to her. He wasn't, but she didn't like the little pride flag pin he was wearing. She demanded to see the manager, so I popped out, listened to her tear into my kids, validated how she was feeling, but pointed out that the work she had asked for was done, done correctly, and her bill was due on pickup of the piece. The last straw for her came when she pulled out a credit card and I had to inform her that we don't accept that particular card. She literally asked me, do you know who I am? Which I didn't, still don't, don't care. And I told her we'd take a personal check. She wrote out a check, problem solved. I deposited the day's checks and got a note from my bank that one had bounced. Her check, of course. I called her the next day to inform her that her check had been returned for insufficient funds and that she'd need to come in and pay her bill, plus the extra fee for a return check. All of these fees, just to point this out, were clearly outlined on the service agreement she'd signed, and we'd already discounted her $120 just to be nice. Anyway, she rolls up into the office carrying a bag, and I knew exactly what was going on. She drops, of course, a bag of pennies on the front desk. She's breathing heavily. We're on the second floor and she'd taken the stairs and she announces triumphantly that she's here to pay her bill. She just needs to go get the rest of our hard-earned money, said with a sneer, of course. The kid at the front desk looks like he's about to cry, so I stop working on the thing I'm working on and take over. How many more bags do you have? I ask her and she says that the nice people at the bank loaded them up in her car. She didn't count them. I told her that that was fine. We'd wait for her to bring them all up and then settle up her bill. She was expecting a bigger reaction, I think. Either that or she hadn't thought this through. 10,000 pennies plus the extra $25 weighs a lot, and she'd just committed to carrying them through a parking lot and up a flight of stairs. One of my kids, bless his heart, offered to help her carry them. She refused. Finally, shaking and sweaty, she deposited the last of the bags on the countertop. The pennies were loose, not in coin rolls. She'd done some work to prove her point. What she hadn't counted on was that we'd need to count the pennies. While the other kids took care of other clients and fixed things in the back, the front desk guy and I counted up the pennies. She started to realize that this was going to take a while and tried to leave. I told her that she couldn't leave until we'd signed off on her bill. Since at this point she was in violation of her service agreement and had passed a bad check, we couldn't just take her word for it. And I would inform our local constabulary if she left without paying. I was kind of talking out of my butt, but she'd managed to tick me off a little. The other clients in the shop came and went, and we counted. Phone calls came in and were handled by my kids, and we counted. She sat down in a chair, folding steel, not super comfortable, stood up again, walked around the office, and we counted. After a while, she said, just forget it, and took out $125 in bills. We signed off on her agreement, and she started to leave. Another one of my kids, bless his heart, asked her if she wanted help carrying the pennies back to her car. She looked at all of us with a face of sheer panic, mumbled, no, thank you. Just keep them. And bolted. The whole shop was silent for a moment. Then one of the kids started giggling and nobody could stop. People coming in thought we'd gone nuts and I finally had to banish everybody to the back room until they could breathe again. We loaded the bags into my vehicle. We used the elevator she'd walked by a few times, took them to the bank and used the coin machine to deposit them, then wrote out a donation to our local shelter for the amount she dropped off. She posted something nasty on Facebook about it and got ratioed. She had, of course, posted earlier about what she was going to do and she got called out with her own post. 
My favorite response was something like, you said you were going to pay your bill in pennies. You paid your bill in pennies. What went wrong? Please don't pay your bills in pennies, folks, especially if you're just doing it to be a jerk. Love it. I don't get the audacity when you're already almost 70% off, especially when the money doesn't seem like such a big deal. I don't see why OP said she took issue with the pride flag. Seems like she was just super entitled and stuck up. Like those videos we've all seen of politicians being pulled over by police and of course it comes out, do you know who I am? No lady, we don't. Nobody does. Now pay your bill and move on. The comments were pretty fantastic on this one. Shell Chang said, modern pennies are two and a half grams, so $125 in pennies would weigh a little over 31 kilograms or 68 pounds. Maybe a bit more if there were enough pre-1982 pennies mixed in, which are mostly copper and weigh 3.1 grams. OP replied, I love that you did the math. She had them in three or four canvas bags as well, just carting them up the stairs. The office smelled like sweat for a while. We had to open some windows. Rogue Nine said, in response to, we used the elevator she walked by a few times. I am at work, so I'm having a difficult time holding in my laughter. What an amazing cherry on top. OP said, yeah, it was just a little bonus on top of everything else. The kids kept whispering, why isn't she using the elevator? Until one of them realized that she was walking by it and not noticing it multiple times. She was the first one to lose it when the client finally left. Gemini said, I was rather hoping that, just as she went to leave, one of the kids pushed the elevator button and got in, right in front of her. OP replied, I mean, one of my shop kids at the time was in a wheelchair. How did she think he got up there? Drop Dead Fred said, a wild Karen appeared. Wild Karen used malicious compliance. It wasn't very effective. Wild Karen hurt itself in its confusion. Our next story is, you're capping commissions on our most in-demand vehicles because you're not doing any extra work, so you shouldn't get extra money? Fine, let's see how that works out for you. I realized that this story could absolutely be current, but it's not. Another thread reminded me of it, and I think it absolutely fits here, so here goes. Back in 2014, I was selling cars. Ford, specifically. For all those who aren't car buffs, both the Mustang and F-150 were getting ground-up redesigns for 2015 and Ford had just announced that there would be no Shelby Mustangs or Raptor F-150s for 2015. Instantly, we were fielding several calls a day about these vehicles. And almost overnight, the inventory we had came with a 10 to 20K market adjustment due to demand. RGM loved both vehicles and traded for them whenever he could because he loved chatting about them with buyers. So we had 21 Raptors and six Shelbys still on the lot when I sold a Ruby Red Raptor extended cab at 10K over sticker the last week of the month. Both are crazy numbers for the less than 200 new cars we sold per month. With the trade, I was due about $4,200 in commission, but my check was about $1,700 light. Come the first Saturday morning meeting after payday, we were told that commissions on such vehicles would be capped at $2,500 retro to last month for a previously ignored provision in our pay plan. There was much grumbling, but management stood firm, citing how incredibly easy Raptors and Shelby deals were. They weren't wrong about that. There was no such thing as a test drive until the deal was done. You could absolutely drive the car before you bought it, but only after we had a signed buyer's order, credit application, and the deal had been submitted and approved. They were generally in and out in under 45 minutes, if not half an hour. But still, dealership gets free money and doesn't want to share? Cue malicious compliance. I talked to several other salespeople, and they were all upset, and we colluded. I whipped up a little Excel macro widget that would take the invoice price, hold back, add in pack and whatnot, and spit out a sales price that would produce an exactly $2,500 commission. I sent it to every salesperson we had, and everyone used it. It only took three signed buyer's orders with seemingly arbitrary numbers for the desk to figure out what we were doing and to call another meeting. That meeting was basically management yelling at us, and the entire sales staff calmly saying, remove the cap or you'll never see another signed buyer's order that exceeds it. Frack you. The cap was lifted three days later. This is genius. I'm pretty sure most, if not all, commission structures have a below average base salary. The point is to get people to work harder based on the incentive that they'll get paid relative to getting more sales or working harder. This seems petty and stupid to me on the part of management. Commission is a percentage. So if they had just left it, everyone would win. But they just had to get greedy. Too bad for them this rock and sales team was all over it. A good team knows their numbers. Let's check out the comments. Billiam posted this. Salesman. I'll give you $10,000 in sales, and you give me $500. Boss. 
Okay, but only twice a day. Salesman, you got it. Only sells twice a day. Boss, stares in corporate. Desert Rock said, if it weren't for sales commission caps at IBM, Ross Perot wouldn't have started his own competing company and become a billionaire. Technos posted, I used to work with a guy that turned down business because his assistants, the folks that did most of the work on any deal, wouldn't make anything extra. Bob was our best sales critter. What he could do in January took most people six months, and we had people who couldn't meet Bob's January numbers even given an entire year. It's not that the other salespeople were bad. Even the weakest one made at least a million a year for the company. Anyway, the company announces that they've got a new, better bonus structure. Associates and assistants would now make more money. They're going to get an extra fractional percentage of any deal. But they would now be capped at $10,000 a quarter. Bob didn't like that. Bob got zero deals signed that month. The new rules meant the deals he'd already had in the pipeline exceeded the amount needed to get his people paid. So why look for more? When the company reversed the cap, Bob suddenly had 30 million bucks in deals and his people made 40K. Our final story is, won't replace a brand new broken lawnmower, but will let me return and reorder? Okay. So I bought a riding lawnmower a few years ago from a big home store. I paid for delivery and upon said delivery, it didn't start. The delivery truck had left by the time I had gotten gas in it and figured this out, so I called the store. I explained that my brand new, just delivered today lawnmower was not starting and immediately the person on the phone asked me if I purchased the extended warranty. I hadn't, so they told me it would cost $100 to have them come get the lawnmower and then however much more the repairs were. Mind you, this was brand freaking new. In my mind, they should bring me a new one to replace the one that didn't work upon delivery. No matter how much I argued this, worker was sticking to their story. I quickly changed my tactic and asked what the return policy was. As long as a return was initiated within 30 days, I could have a full refund, including the cost of delivery, and the store would come pick up the mower for me at no additional cost. So I pointed out that the store wouldn't replace my non-working item by taking one trip to my house to pick up the non-working one and bring me one that worked, and instead would make two trips to pick up the one that didn't work and then bring me the one I purchased the second time as a totally different transaction. The worker said yes, and when I tried to point out how that made no sense, he didn't want to hear it. So right then and there, I initiated a refund. I then immediately ordered a new one and had him set up the delivery date. After that date was set, we had to schedule the date for pickup of the old mower, and I made myself unavailable for any date other than the delivery date for the new one. So even though he had insisted they wouldn't just bring me a replacement mower and pick the first one, they were now doing just that, but with the additional paperwork of processing a return and additional paperwork for delivery of the new mower. The manager called me later that day to apologize for the hassle, and they ended up waiving my delivery fee. Gotta love those store policies that just seem to make no sense and complicate things that should be simple. Buy something and it doesn't work out of the box? That's a return, an exchange. I understand the employee's position and even the policy for maybe 90% of the situations, but there's gotta be some common sense when the policy just doesn't fit. If you tell me you can't exchange something that never once worked because I put fuel in a piece of machinery that requires fuel, I'm just going to feel scammed and angry. Let's see what others thought before we wrap up. Rev Curiel said, Sometimes workers are stuck with policies that they know are stupid, but don't have the authority to do anything about it. Congrats on finding a workaround. But I'm surprised they just dropped off the first mower. When I bought mine, they put a small amount of fuel in and started it at the shop. Then on delivery, the driver started it and drove it a little to show me that it worked then had me start and drive it so they knew I was doing it right and wouldn't call about it not working if I, say, tried to start without the brake on. Cyanny D said, On the other hand, some employees are just so inadequately trained that they have no idea how to proceed with non-standard requests. Listen, I went to Arby's. They've had Swiss cheese roast beef sandwiches for, like, ever. They've never stopped with the Swiss or the beef or having buns. But let me tell you, I pulled up to an Arby's and the guy at the register had no idea how to put in a basic roast beef sandwich with Swiss cheese. Like, this wasn't me asking for some five-flavor latte at Starbucks. So while there's policies, there's also a thing going on with training. Wadsworth McStumpy said, I've worked in places where we had to follow stupid policies like that, but we made every effort to hide it from the customer. The customer only ever saw us take back the defective item and give them a new one. They didn't see that we had to do the extra paperwork to follow the manufacturer's rules. You might have to do stupid things at work, but that's no reason to look stupid in front of your customers. And yeah, we'd sometimes eat the shipping costs. That's a cost of doing business.
If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.